Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? It's Thursday, January 18, 2024, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. California Congresswoman Barbara Lee is kicked out of a House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee hearing on Cuba policy because the Republican chair didn't like what she had to say. She joins us to tell us what she had to say and why she was kicked out. President Joe Biden stopping in North Carolina, announcing $82 million in new investments from the American Rescue Plan for rural uh, high-speed internet. Also, he talked about how the economy is proving specifically as it relates to African Americans and Latinos. The time is ticking for the Biden administration to decide about the ban on menthol cigarettes. Carol Magruder, co-founder of and co-chair of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council, will join us to discuss it. The Department of Justice report of the 2022 Uvalde mass shooting points out critical mistakes that cost the lives of 21 children. And what would Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s stance be on DEI? Well, some white billionaires and conservatives are up in arms against DEI, saying he would be against it. But conservative Chris Metzler, Dr. Chris Metzler, will join us to say they are dead wrong. Plus, Spelman College got the largest ever single donation to an HBCU. Their president, Dr. Helene Gale, will join me to talk about this $100 million gift. It is time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Thank you. 
between every country in the world and the people of the United States and the government of the United States, whether we agree or disagree. Gentle, the only way to ensure the values of democracy been, are promoted is being at the table, engaging Fidel with Fidel Castro has been the worst dictator that the hemisphere has seen since the arrival of Christopher Columbus well, in 1492. Sure so I, I, I Oh, a little mayhem on Capitol Hill today uh, as Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California, uh, who has made frequent visits to Cuba, has spoken uh, on this issue of relations for quite some time. Uh, she joins us right now on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Congresswoman, always glad to see you. Um, I, I remember when the Obama administration uh, established relationships uh, with Cuba. Uh, you were there. We carried your remarks live with what was taking place. What the heck happened today? For this, first of all, on the subcommittee, are you a member of that subcommittee? Roland, uh, first, they're trying to silence me. Uh, as a black woman, we have points of views that may not agree or disagree with um, the chairwoman of a committee. This is unprecedented. Never has a member of Congress been denied um, a waiver. I was on this committee for uh, maybe eight to ten years on the Subcommittee on Appropriations, the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee. Now I'm the ranking member on the Appropriations Subcommittee that funds all of our international humanitarian development assistance, uh, embassy security. I was chairing that committee uh, two years ago when we were in the majority. And so, yes, I have been trying to normalize relations with Cuba since the 70s, mind you, when I worked for the great late Congressman Ron Dellums. This is nothing new. It's important to me that a country, an Afro-Hispanic country 90 miles away, have normal relations with the United States. The only way we can get all the differences ironed out and talked about and discussed is having dialogue and having a movement forward like President Obama established. So I've been there many times. This chair of this committee interviewed Fidel Castro, and she has glowing things to say about Fidel Castro. So I don't know what's wrong with her. But the point is, uh, and I thank Debbie Wasserman Schultz, because she disagrees with me totally on Cuba, on Israel, on a lot of issues. But she refused to uh, stay at the committee hearing because she was allowed the waiver and I was not. So th this right here um, is the uh, notice uh, that it was called the myth of the new Cuban entrepreneurs an analysis of the Biden administration's Cuban policy. The chair there is Maria Salazar. And so <clears throat> explain to our viewers and listeners how this works. If you're not if you're not a member of a subcommittee, um, what rights and privileges do members of Congress have to attend or speak on other committees? Just explain to the people who don't know the process. Sure. The process is you ask for a waiver, the waiver is granted, regardless of which party you belong to. It has never been denied. It was denied today because I have a different point of view from the chair. Waivers for members of Congress are automatically granted. Like I said, I don't serve on that committee. I served on it for years. But that has no reason why I should be allowed or not allowed. The point is, members of Congress are granted waivers to participate in committee hearings that they're not a part of if, in fact, uh, they ask for a waiver. And that's just what we do. And so she's trying to silence me. What she's trying to do is, is do what the Republican extremists, um, MAGA Republican extremists are doing, and that's trying to ban books, trying to, uh, you know, defund uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, initiatives. They're trying to follow Donald Trump's autocratic agenda. Uh, and what her move was today demonstrated that she really doesn't believe in democracy. She believes in only her point of view. She does not believe in the inclusion of different points of views uh, when we talk about Cuban policy. Finally, I'll just say this. I have legislation that I'm writing on Cuban entrepreneurship. I know Cuba very well. And I know that the private sector there needs to be uh, supported uh, and, in fact, help to develop their economy and to create jobs. And so there are many supporting this legislation, both Democrats and Republicans. And so for her to, on a, such an issue as entrepreneurship, 
uh, for the Cuban people in the private sector, knowing that I'm writing this legislation, is pretty suspect to me. Again, she's trying to silence me. What they do all the time in different ways, if you're an African-American, if you're an African-American woman, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, this MAGA extremist party, the Republican Party, is trying to shut us out of our voice to try to dismantle this democracy and keep us uh, marginalized. But I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, this is the tweet that Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz of, of Florida uh, posted. She said, I was grateful Representative Maria Salazar invited me to join her hearing as we both fight for human rights in Cuba. But I refused to participate when my colleague, uh, Representative Barbara Lee, was shut out due to her opposing views. In democracies, we debate freely and openly even when we uh, disagree. Uh, and so, so Salazar invites Washington Schultz to speak. Were you invited or did you choose to show up on your own? No, we both requested a waiver. Got it, got it. So both of you requested a waiver. Both of you requested a waiver. Uh, and then, um, and then, so she granted the waiver to Washington Schultz. But well, she did not agree, agree to a waiver for Barbara Lee because I have different points of views. And her and Wasserman Schultz agree on many issues, which is fine. I talk with Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz quite a bit about our disagreements and what we agree on. But that has nothing to do with a waiver. What has to do with a waiver is that she denied me a waiver because I disagree with her point of view or she disagrees with mine. She doesn't even know what I was going to say. She does not know, probably doesn't even know about my legislation. She may. But uh, once again, the issue is silencing. And I said, you know, black women have points of views that may or may not be consistent with her point of view. So why would you say no to an African-American woman with a heck of a lot of uh, foreign policy experience, much more than hers? Wow. Uh, that uh, certainly uh, is uh, not something that uh, one, one would expect. Um, what's your next? Yes, it is, Roland. Yes, it is. <clears throat> With these MAGA extremist Republicans, that's who they are. What's your next step? Pardon? What's, uh, what, what, what's your next step? What's next for you? Well, I'm going to continue writing my bill. I'm going to continue working on the organizations and the businesses who are supporting it. I'm going to introduce the bill, and it's going to be a bill about how we can help spur the private sector and entrepreneurship in Cuba. I'm going to keep at it. You know me, Roland. I'm not going to stop behind some crap from a chair of a committee who doesn't know what she's talking about and who's trying to act in an undemocratic fashion and who wants to follow Donald Trump and his autocratic lead. Uh, you know, it's scary, though, I tell you, in terms of just how blatant they are in time, terms of trying to dismantle our democracy. So see it in the, that context. This is another one of their tactics to begin to erode our democracy so Donald Trump can come in and have a total government that uh, does... Uh, who, what she did today in terms of his conduct and in terms of his policies. She's shutting down opposition. And she talks about Cuba. Come on. She's doing what she claims that, she's that she opposes in terms of shutting down people, silencing people who have different points of views. Well, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, the, you posted this about an hour ago. <clears throat> immediately hit you said, hey, I uh, would love to have you come on. So we appreciate uh, you taking some time to come on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Nice being with you. Thank you. I love your intro. It's, it's a happy intro. It's beautiful. <laughs> and after today, I needed that. And so thank you so much. Uh, you can thank, uh, in, you can thank in Vogue for that uh, because uh, they actually uh, did that uh, song and they gifted it to me uh, for this show. And so uh, we appreciate them doing that. It's, it's wonderful. So thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Made me smile. All right. Appreciate it. Glad, okay. glad to make you smile. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye -bye. Folks, I'm going to go to the break. We come back. I'm going to actually play for you uh, the live feed from that hearing. Uh, and Congressman Woman Lee said that when she started talking, they actually cut the microphone. I'm going to play that for you. We come back right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We just have one of the oldest cultures that's desperately needed for mutual salvation. That's the consciousness. We have the keys in our roots to save mankind. We get to see the, the condition of other countries, other oceans, other cultures. And if we believe in God, a lot of us do. He's telling us, if you don't get rid of that stuff, 
that makes somebody superior or inferior and work together for their mutual salvation, everybody's gone. Next on The Frequency, we're talking about racism. My guest, Danica Moore, comes on to discuss her fight against racism that she and her daughter face. The thing about racism, you can't outrun it, you can't control it, you can't predict when it's gonna happen to you or your seed. She's also gonna give us solutions on how to handle the situation. That's here on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. This is your boy, Earthquake. And you're tuned in to Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, uh, glad uh, you could join us right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black uh, Star Network. So um, this uh, hearing that took place today on Capitol Hill, uh, I'm going to show you the beginning of this hearing. Uh, it, and what actually took place. You can see how this thing unfolded. So watch this. Jury will come to order. Chairwoman, uh, I wanted to ask unanimous consent for representatives Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida and Barbara Lee of California, both senior members of the Committee on Appropriations, to participate in this hearing after all members have had their chance to question the witnesses. Um, thank you for that request. Uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz It's more than welcome. Barbara Lee is not. Uh, can I ask you? Now. Can I ask you uh, the reasoning, Chairwoman? Uh, the reason I ask. Oh, I can tell you about the, the, the reasoning is because uh, uh, Barbara Lee, who I know is a distinguished member of the Democratic Party, is a um, friends with the oppressors and not with the Cuban people. Barbara Lee has been friends with Fidel Castro, and she was. Uh, she there are many statements that we can uh, repeat and that indicates that she is just not with the people that I represent who are the Cuban exile community in Miami. Sure. She is not a friend of the Cuban people that we are trying to liberate. Uh, point of personal privilege, if I could respond really quick. Uh, Chairwoman, you know I respect your work, uh, even though our positions on different issues with respect to the Western Hemisphere and Latin America are sometimes far apart. Uh, I, res I respected your voice and your work and the policy that you worked on, uh, but this move to not allow one of our colleagues in the United States Congress, who's been elected by the people she represents, to sit and participate on a panel like this is, I think, unprecedented. Uh, and if it's happened before, I don't know about it. And I know that, like many, uh, you have been critical of the government in Cuba in part because it suppresses free speech and suppresses different opinions. And so without getting to the substance of your critique of Congresswoman Lee, uh, Chairwoman, that's exactly what you're doing right now is you're suppressing somebody from even sitting here and participating in the same way that the Cuban government has suppressed opinion and perspective for decades. My dear colleague, Cuban people do not have a platform to express themselves like uh, distinguished lady Barbara Lee or Congresswoman Barbara Lee has had because she has been able to go to many media outlets. She's been able to express her admiration for Fidel Castro, but this is not the site to do that. She has no um, position or she is not welcomed on this committee that I humbly chair. So I thank you very much for your, um, for your um, request, but not this time. Therefore, the subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere will come to order.
Now, folks, uh, I want you to let this continue to go because Congresswoman Lee said when she began to speak, they cut the audio so you cannot hear her speak. That's why this video here that she posted on her YouTube, excuse me, on her Twitter feed, uh, this, pull, pull a video up, y'all. That's why this video was posted, because now you got an opportunity to hear, uh, to hear her speak. And so if you can put this in a two box, you'll see where she's speaking, uh, but, but, but the actual feed that's on the YouTube channel, uh, they actually cut the audio uh, so you would not hear her. Uh, and uh, that's that's really what they did. So let's do this. Here. Let's just go back to the other video. Uh, let's keep that video going. I'm going to bring in uh, uh, my panel because I want to hear where that audio pick, picks back up. Do we have it there? Let's the kill the video from her Twitter feed. I only want the I only want to kill that one. I want the video uh, from my iPad. So you see how that's going on. Like, they cut the video. So I just want to introduce the panel. Keep that going right now. Uh, my panel today uh, is Lawn Victoria Burke. Uh, she's a writer with uh, the NNPA, uh, coming to us uh, from Arlington, Texas. Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies, Howard University, Washington, D.C. John Quill Neal, trial lawyer with the John Quill Neal firm out of Atlanta. Greg, I want to start with you because uh, here's the thing here. Here's the thing here that people don't quite uh, understand. Uh, and, and that is, uh, let's go to the panel, folks, and then uh, I will keep the audio up because I want to hear when they come back uh, from that hearing. First of all, people don't have any understanding, any understanding of the relationship uh, between African Americans and Cuba. You heard Salazar talking about how Congresswoman Barbara Lee uh, is against the Cuban people. Mm, no, she's not. Uh, but, but, but this is the difference between what we know as white Cubans in this country, that, that group out of Florida uh, that has despised Fidel Castro uh, and Afro Cubans, and you've always had uh, this bad blood here, and you've had many of them who never liked the fact that CBC members and African American civil rights leaders and others had relationships and understandings with Fidel Castro in Cuba. That's right. That's right. Shout out to uh, to Barbara Lee, who has always been consistent on the question of Cuba. Um, we saw that in recent days, one of Asada Shakur's comrades made transition. You know how they let folks out of jail just so they can pass away a few months after being out of jail. Um, Matula Shakur and others. Um, uh, Maria Elvira Salazar. Oh, Congresswoman Salazar. Yes, the Miami 27, Little Havana. The woman who back in November, uh, when she endorsed that fool, uh, Javier Millet, who is now the president of Argentina, she praised Argentina as having only one culture, one religion, and one race, completely homogenous. Uh, she's a white nationalist and a white supremacist, and she's a hemi hemispheric white nationalist and white supremacist. Uh, Cuba means white Cubans for her, whether it be Miami or Havana. Argentina means white Argentinians. There is no one race in Argentina. There are Afro-Argentinians and, and indigenous Argentinians as well, but not in the mind of this racist. Um, she did what she is supposed to do. They have no respect for any form of institutions. She had the gavel and she used it. So what we saw there, of course, was an example of the white nationalists and the Republican Party now saying there is no such thing as the U.S. Congress. There is white nationalism. It's a simple courtesy, often, and, you know, Lauren, having worked on the Hill, knows about this a lot better than, than I ever will. You know, when a member comes into a subcommittee that she or he is not on uh, at the time and wants to give a testimony or make some remarks, it's pro forma, except when you've got a white nationalist with the gavel. Maria Salazar knows that she can't face her white nationalist dying, I might add, white nationalist constituents in South Florida without standing up and saluting her white nationalist ideology. And that's what we saw at play right there. Lauren, to that particular point, I mean, it's common courtesy in Congress. And Salazar was adamant, oh, no, I will let Democratic Congresswoman De Debbie Wasserman Schultz speak 
uh, who is uh, obviously a, a white member of Congress from Florida, I am not letting this black woman, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, speak. Yeah, so what it's really about is not that you won't let a member who's not on the subcommittee speak. It's about not letting a member who disagrees with your views speak, which is now becoming a standard Republican practice across the board, a complete intolerance for anybody else's opinion or views, uh, and, of course, the sort of destruction of custom, which they're increasingly good at, from trying to bring guns onto the floor of the U.S. House, in, in which uh, Speaker Pelosi then had to install metal detectors, brandishing weapons during committee meetings, uh, all sorts of nonsense, because, you know, that's what you do when you think you're so right about everything and you want to have this sort of threatening, menacing, dangerous air. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this, of course, is the playing around with the live feed, the playing around with the audio and cutting all that off. Because, of course, the other thing that they're all about is hiding what their actions are. You want to talk about consciousness of guilt, hiding what your actions are for everybody else, uh, lest they go back and look at any of this uh, independently in any way. You know, so... Of course, if they did, there would be a bunch of gaslighting, as there is with the footage from uh, January 6, 2021. But at any rate, it just shows you what this is, which is this is just the production of YouTube videos, the production of video for some fundraising email that was later to go out. That's what the Republicans do during these hearings across the board. All right, folks, welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Um, the issue of banning menthol cigarettes has been one that we've talked about on this show on numerous occasions. Uh, and the Biden administration is being pushed uh, to make this decision by uh, the 20th to give the Food Dr Drug Administration at least a year uh, to be able uh, to implement this. And so, therefore, uh, it will go into effect by Inauguration Day 2020, excuse me, 2025. Of course, there's been a lot of back and forth uh, that has existed uh, because you've had uh, tobacco interests uh, bringing on uh, and paying uh, civil rights organizations, paying uh, different groups as well in order uh, to advance their interests and the Biden administration actually had delayed this decision a couple of months ago and said they would make a decision uh, by the month of uh, March. But, uh, again, supporters are saying, people who want to get, get rid of menthol cigarettes say, no, that needs to happen uh, a heck of a lot sooner. Carol Magruder is the co-founder and co-chair of the African-American Tobacco Control Leadership Council. She told us right now, Carol, uh, there was, there, there was a, a march, if, if you will, a funeral procession uh, down Black Lives Matter Plaza in D.C. today uh, with a rally ending uh, in uh, ending at the um, in La La Lafayette Park. So explain to folks, if the Biden administration initially said they'll make a decision by March, why the push for January 20th? Well, good evening, Roland. First of all, and thank you for having us on. Uh, we have been waiting for the ruling on menthol since uh, 2009, when President Barack Obama at that time, it seems like a century ago, signed the Tobacco Control Act that gave the FDA the authority to regulate the tobacco industry. At that time, all of the flavors in combustible tobacco was taken off the market except for menthol, and that was because of that was negotiated. Um, and there was a, an amendment to the Tobacco Control Act at the behest of the Congressional Black Caucus, Honorable Donna Christensen, that made the FDA have to do something. So we've been waiting since 2009. Um, my organization, the AATCLC, along with ASH and the American Medical Association, the National Medical Association, Association sued the FDA, and they had promised a ruling by 2023. And so here we are in 2024, and we know that this road is fraught with interference by the tobacco industry, and we want to keep ahead of that curve as much as poor people who do public health policy work can in terms of fighting this giant tobacco industry with their billions of dollars of resources. And we want to keep this at the front and center on the Biden-Harris White House that we are expecting them to keep their word and to save the lives of the 45,000 black people who die every year in the United States of America from tobacco-induced diseases. 
Um, and, yeah. and so, again, so the pushes for the 20th, what are you hearing? Is it going to happen? Obviously, uh, Big Tobacco is doing all they can. Uh, they've been paying black law enforcement executives to say that, oh, uh, if this happens, then black people who with cigarettes are going to be targeted. That's a lie. Uh, and different things along those lines. They've had their meetings. They've been trying to uh, get Congressional Black Caucus members to pull back on um, their support for banning menthol cigarettes. Uh, and also paying off other civil rights uh, organizations as well to uh, to accept uh, their position. Yes, and so that's why it's important for us. You know, all of public health was there today. It was I, we were so grateful, so humbled, so proud. Um, the campaign for tobacco-free kids, the American Heart Association, American Lung Association, American Cancer Society, the Action Network, amongst other African American and people of color organizations, were there to say we want our government to protect Black lives. And so the majority of the people there weren't even African American, which was wonderful because it was like we are our brother's keeper, and that this injustice of leaving these products on the market for these decades has to stop. So we see the industry. Put pulling out all the stops. And so we are pulling out all the stops that we have the power to do. And in conjunction with today, you know, the American Conference of Mayors was meeting in D.C. They had their own press conference with some of the leadership of Karen Bass, the mayor of Los Angeles, and other African-American mayors standing up saying, we will not let the pernicious racist targeting of the tobacco industry be flipped and used against us now when we're trying to protect our people and to get these products off of the U.S. market, as Canada has done, as the European Union has done, as Ethiopia has done. And so when we talk about passing a law roll, and it's not a one and done, this is the beginning. And so we need services for our people. We're taking off one of the most addictive substances on the face of the earth, which is nicotine. And our people need services. And so that's part of we attended uh, Biden's moonshot. Uh, he had a, a meeting at the White House June 1st of last year about cessation, how to help people to stop smoking. So we're talking about racism. We're talking about the different things, how this shows up in our community and how it needs to be addressed in our community to save black lives. And so I'm looking at the footage you have, and it just was a global glorious day. Um, you know, we came out in the cold. I'm a Californian. And we came out and uh, we showed up and it was wonderful. It was a wonderful, positive experience to show this country and the rest of the world that we're here. We're not going anywhere. Um, I started this when we used to do the protests. I'd have my Kaiser card. Now I have my Medicare card rolling. But I'm <laughs> still here and I still conti will continue until this is done, until my people are not being uh, persistently and racistly targeted by the tobacco industry. Uh, questions uh, from Pam Long, you first. Um, so obviously, I mean, I think that this is clearly a money and politics moment. So many of these civil rights groups are completely silent on something they shouldn't be completely silent on. What is your guess as to what the White House is going to do? Do you have any, do you have any prediction? You know, so it, it, my colleague, Dr. Valerie Yerger, wrote a research paper almost 20 years ago, Smoking with the Enemy, that documented from the tobacco industry's own documents that have been released or because of litigation, how they systematically went after us as black people. And that has changed. So we have Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated who, who got out front of this, and they've had two resolutions. We have the National Medical Association, our black doctors. We have the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People who passed a resolution in 2016. So in spite of the tobacco industry interference, there are many important and powerful leadership groups. The National Council of Negro Women with my sister Siobhan in D.C., They've come out. So there are our, our groups, our leadership groups are in support of this. And they are the groups that actually have a real constituency in terms of voting. You know, the NAACP, the National Council for Negro Women, they, when they speak to their constituents, they listen. They are respected. Delta Sigma Theta, they are respected. And so, and I think that, you know, as we approach this election year, that the Biden-Harris administration, and we had a press conference, well, not a press conference, we had a meeting with them on Zoom, um, where we could see them and they could see us, and they can see that the people who have, the people who are voting, who are constituents, are in support of taking this deadly product off the market that kills more black people than everything else combined. And that it's not magic, 
there needs to be some other things that go with it. And we're here to make sure that those other things that go with it, the services, the, the you know, our, our attorney generals came out with a letter um, yesterday or this week that, you know, the enforcement that we're talking about, it's not about the individual. It's not about a brother on the corner smoking a cigarette and the police are going to come up and say, is that a menthol? This is about the head of the snake. This is about the tobacco industry and that these products will no longer be available in our country to be smuggled, to be uh, black marketed. So, and, and, and the services that we need with that as well. Jacqueline? Yes, thank you so much for being here. And I am a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And I'm so proud that we have come out with a resolution and have been very active on this specific issue. Um, what I wanted to say is that there are some reports out there that the Biden administration, uh, Biden Harris administration, has not moved forward um, with pushing this ban through um, with the fear of losing the black vote at the during this election cycle. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So my thoughts are, are just what I said is that we had a call with the White House. So on that call was President Derek Johnson from the NACP, Siobhan from the National Council of, of Negro Women. There were people on the call who really do have constituents who listen and who are who are guided by the organizations that they're members of, Delta Sigma Theta. And I think that the Biden-Harris administration, they really could see that this is not something that the industry, the tobacco industry, is just going to manipulate and have a, a showing and, and prey upon our, our, our gut feelings of trauma that we've had and experienced in this country as black people at the hands of, uh, of, of police brutality. That, that's not going to be the trade-off to save the 45,000 black folks who die every year from this, and that we're not going to allow them to use this as an excuse, as a smokescreen, to deal with things that we, we, need to, we need to grapple with in this country and that we are grappling with. But in the meantime, we have to grapple with the biggest wolf, the biggest killer, the biggest targeter of black men, which is Newport cigarettes and cool cigarettes. Those are the biggest targeters and killers of black men. It's not the police departments. Greg? Greg? Greg, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Thank you, Roland. And thank you, uh, Sister Magruder. This might not be, uh, John Quill asked, I think, the, the salient question in terms of the politics of it. So I want to ask a question that may not be relevant, and I don't know, but uh, we know yesterday uh, Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo was argued at the Supreme Court. We know the right wing is trying to kick the teeth out of the administrative state. Uh, yesterday, they were talking about the Chevron doctrine. They want to say that courts, not administrative agencies, will have the uh, should have the power to interpret statutes. Now, I know that this, this, these regs that FDA uh, wants to put forth uh, are pursuant to federal legislation. Are you worried at all that these tobacco companies could come back and say that the, the courts should decide whether or not menthol and all of the other flavors that have already been banned should be banned or not, and that maybe all of them could be brought back? Or is that something we shouldn't... I mean, obviously, it's nothing we, we should worry about right we now. We should definitely be concerned about that, because what the tactics of the industry are, are delay. So anything that they can do to, to delay the, the righteous cause that we're fighting, they do. And so we saw in California... We fought for, in California, we passed a state law to take these products off the market. The tobacco industry collected signatures. They put a referendum on the ballot. We fought the referendum. We, and 60% of California said, we want these products off the market. What do they do? They have a lawsuit. So we anticipate that most likely they will have a lawsuit. And this is, Roland, where you're so important in this, in this equation, is that our people need to wake up, and they need to reject these products. Even if you're a menthol smoker, I, my brother's a menthol smoker, my oldest brother. I have, you know, people, some of my best friends are, are menthol smokers, so I know the struggle. But whatever you do, do you want that to pass down to the next generation of black children, to the next generation of young people? And so this is the, the norm, the cultural norm that the industry, the tobacco industry has created. This is part of what we're fighting. And so this is not going to be something that's going to just happen overnight. It's a process. And we need to begin that process. And so we do anticipate that there will be lawsuits, that they'll do everything that they can, because they do not want to let their hooks out of our community. They do not want to let 
the 45,000 black people who, who would still be alive, people like myself who are mothers, who are fathers, who are grandparents, who are the stability of our families, the fabric of our communities. Those are the people who die prematurely from tobacco-induced diseases. Those are the people that we're protecting. But equally, we're saying not another generation. So whether or not, and we're, we're working with services, the CDC is rolling out a menthol campaign. <clears throat> Health departments all over the country are getting on board. So it's a process, and our, but our people need to wake up that this is a political issue as much as it is a health issue, and they need to reject these products. And smokers, you're, you're paying tobacco taxes. You're paying for services. So you need to demand that you have cessation, that you have uh, these products that can help you to get off of, off of nicotine. You have a right to those products, and we're fighting equally for that as well. All right, then. Uh, Carol, we appreciate it. Keep up the fight. I appreciate you, Roland. <laughs> All right, thanks a bunch. All right, folks, we come back. Republicans, conservatives constantly attacking DEI. Uh, the latest, you know, uh, it's always something CRT, affirmative action, quotas, you name it, anything uh, that advances black folks, you know, they are against. Well, black conservative joins us next and say, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. You're watching Roland Martin on the filter on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Be sure to join our Brina Funk fan club. So you're checking money, order the P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dallas Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. We'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. And you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. <laughs> Past several months, you've seen a lot of white conservatives uh, constantly attacking DEI. That's now their new boogeyman. Bill Ackman, this dude right here, a billionaire, he was pissed off with the president of Harvard University, uh, and he called her, said all kinds of different things about her, called her an affirmative action hire. Well, uh, he's been attacking DEI. You also have Elon Musk doing the exact same thing. You've had uh, folks like uh, Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, uh, uh, out there uh, correcting them and challenging them on these different things. Uh, and it now is uh, the, the, the newest thing for the right. And so all you hear, DEI in Florida, they now have banned all DEI programs at state universities, uh, saying, I don't care if you get state or federal funding, you can't use DEI in any way whatsoever. Then, of course, you have the same thing happening in Texas. And so uh, the right is doing all they can. They've been attacking uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, saying that, oh, they're focused on woke policies. And so understand, woke, DEI, that's their new targets. And, of course, they used Dr. King's uh, federal holiday birthday to say, oh, if Dr. King was alive, he would be against these things. Uh, that's what actually Bill Ackman said. And you know damn well Bill Ackman ain't read more a damn book or even more than one speech. He probably even heard one speech by Dr. King, but all of a sudden, he wants to consider himself an expert uh, on Dr. King. They always try to cite Dr. King's 1963 I Have a Dream speech, and they always want to quote the content of character, but they ain't got a damn thing to say about what's at the top of that speech because that's the real stuff they don't want to address. 
We're joining me now is Dr. Chris Metzler. He's president and CEO of Metzler Enterprises. Uh, Chris is conservative, uh, and he's made it perfectly clear uh, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, Chris, glad to have you back on the show. And we, I've said this before, this is the new boogeyman for them. So it's CRT, it's quotas, it's affirmative action. Uh, they want to attack anything that confronts the vestiges of racism in this country. Well, that's correct. But here's the thing. They also want to tout diversity. They also want to say such and such is the first black uh, Republican or conservative to be X, Y, and Z. They're talking about that right now with the governor, the uh, the um, lieutenant governor. Uh, looks like Chris. For, you fr froze. Hey, 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 Chris, you froze there. You, you were saying the lieutenant governor of? North Carolina, who they have running for governor, they want to tout him as the first black Republican who is successful. Here's the problem with them. The problem with them is you can be diverse so long as you're like them. So long, and, and that's the difficulty. They're talking about diversity of thought, but whose thought? Diversity of their thought. And the Martin Luther King stuff, now they're trying to redefine what Dr. King said. And the content of character, what the heck does that have to do with employment? Last time I checked, content of character is not an essential function of any job. Well, and, and, and the thing that, that, that trips me out with, with their attacks is uh, they, they're trying to say, oh, uh, with DEI, you're now hiring incompetent people, you know, who are not qualified. No, what you're doing is you're simply saying to these white folks who are hiring, guess what? Don't just keep hiring white folks. You need to go out and find black candidates, Hispanic candidates, uh, Asian American, Native American, and stop hiring the same old, same old. That's what the, the real deal is. They're angry that they're, that they're white boys and white girls can't get the hookup on jobs, they now got to compete. Well, and if, if affirmative action has brought all of these uh, unqualified black folks into the workplace, why is it that we do not have more black CEOs? Why is that? And so this whole discussion is disingenuous, uh, you know, and Ackman, in his whole attack on Dr. Gay, first of all, she never committed plagiarism. Um, it, it should, there were some citation errors she needed to address. And as it relates to his own wife, who was a professor at MIT, she created plagiarism when she was at MIT. So don't give me that crap. They're going back and forth with this nonsense, attacking it, and it's just simply not genuine. Now they're trying to redefine Dr. King's legacy. Charlie Kirk has already said, um, that, in fact, King was not the great civil rights leader. He was a socialist and a communist. And so there is an attempt at this point to redefine his legacy, and uh, that's not going to fly. Um, I was looking at this one clip. Uh, uh, Congressman Dean Phillips, uh, who thinks he's run against Biden, which is a joke, uh, he's removed DEI from his website. Uh, and it's amazing how that happened after Bill Ackman gave a million dollars to a super PAC supporting his campaign. And he's trying to say, oh, no, no one can buy me. Dude, stop it. Ackman yeah. told, you want my money, you got to remove DEI from your website. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Running against Biden doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning, um, but it's taking the money. And that's the bottom line. Questions from uh, the panel. Greg, you're first. Thank you, Ro uh, thank you, Roland. Who make sure I'm on mute? Okay, I'm good. Thank you, Roland, and good to see you, Chris. You know, Same here. yeah. Looking at uh, this, uh, I don't want to call him a cockroach, so I won't. Stephen Miller and America First. Uh, I think they raised four million dollars the first year they were in existence. Twenty one. They raised forty four million dollars in twenty two, and so forth. Uh, they got the EEOC investigating NASCAR. They want them to investigate Lyft and and Dick Sport Goods on on, on abortion policy, travel policy. Um, 
Any thoughts on the danger presented by this white nationalist, who, as we are on this show, is recruiting lawyers through and in conjunction with the Heritage Foundation to stack up for a second Trump administration? Where, where does Stephen Miller and America First, these lawyers, fit in this? Well, here's the biggest danger. If Trump is back in the White House, Stephen Miller is the attorney general. That's the biggest danger. <laughs> and so, and so we're and so we're talking about this. Don't think that Stephen is doing this uh, because he has nothing else to do. Stephen Miller will be the attorney general. He's not going to be White House counsel. He's going to be the attorney general. And so, be prepared for that. Thank you. Well, uh, and and absolutely, that's exactly what they want. Lauren, next. Um. Yeah, I mean. Chris, I mean, don't you think that almost none of this is new? I mean, it seems like this entire conversation is is quite old, actually. I mean, whether it's Chris Rufo or Charles Murray or whoever it is that wants to show up and pretend that their superior comes up with that thesis and then tries to build some public policy around it. Uh, I mean, isn't this just the old racism superiority talk that we've heard since the beginning of time? Well, it is the old one, except for the fact that, you know, what we are doing, um, a number of us in the DEI work is we are responding. Um, we are on the defense. They have a strategy that is embedded. We are re responding. We are reacting. We're doing all of these kinds of things. Traditional civil rights organizations are not in this fight as they need to be in this fight. And as a result of that, every time something comes out, we go, oh, this, 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 and this, but they have a strategic approach. We have a reactionary approach. Well, and the thing is, Chris, even though, first of all, even though it's old, but it's also new because what they're, yeah. what they're angry about, they do not like the advancement that African-Americans have made Latinos have made, and so they are using the affirmative action ruling by the Supreme Court to target companies, affinity groups, to target <laughs> fellowships, to target venture capitalists. And so they want to, this is their entire goal. This is the attack on DEI. They want to dismantle everything that has been put in place to create opportunities <laughs> for upper mobility for black people and others. That is their aim because they believe white people are losing out. Chris, uh, Chris, your feed is frozen. Uh, let me know when you get Chris back. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to, uh, to uh, let me know when Chris is back. Uh, that, John Quell, that really is the deal. They are specifically targeting law firms. Telling, I mean, a week after the Supreme Court ruling, uh, uh, attorney generals sent letters. Senator Tom Cotton sent letters to law firms saying, oh, your programs are now out of compliance or, or unconstitutional. And the ruling didn't have a damn thing to do with their programs. You're exactly right. I mean, it's an attempt to essentially dismantle everything. Going back to when I was growing up, I was... Uh, in the Upper Bound program. Um, I did the Inroads program. Those are programs for minorities and for blacks that prepare them um, for college and prepare them for the workplace. And the eradication of these DEI programs uh, um, from our institutions, although it's been, in my understanding, a select five states at this juncture, um, it really threatens the future um, for African Americans and other minorities as well. Um, moving forward with our ability to get into colleges that are predominantly white institutions, our ability to um, for upward mobility and corporations and government and all of these um, different opportunities that are out here. And it's really threatening the future um, of everyone here. And this is something that I brought last week about even when affirmative action was dismantled. And so it, it's an attack and um, I, and I believe I said it last week that we need to mobilize um, and get to work on this and sending these letters to law firms. I mean, one thing about lawyers is that we know the law and we're going to research it. I, I, I'm not sure what the what the tactic is behind that sending it to law firms that they're out of compliance. Um, because oh, oh, no, no. I, 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 can, I, I can tell you what the tactic is. Uh, we got Chris back. But what, what they want to do is 
They want to scare these firms to say, hey, change it or we're going to sue you. And they're going to like, and actually, some law firms, Chris, have already done that. Corporations are doing that. We're seeing a lot of these companies cut back on DEI initiatives that we knew that was going to take place in the aftermath of George Floyd's death. But what they're doing is they're using the affirmative action ruling to scare corporate America to say, y'all better get rid of all these programs or we're coming after you, and they're going to sick Ed Bloom. You've got Stephen Miller's law firm trying to tell people, oh, if you think that you've lost the job due to DEI, let us know. They want to go after everyone. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, though. The affirmative action case has nothing to do with employment at all. It has nothing to do with right. employment. And, 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 and But that's exactly what they're using. And employers are saying, oh, oh we're scared. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, they still have on the OFCCP regulations, there are still affirmative action requirements. Keep in mind, affirmative action is not just about black people, veterans and women as well. So let's not get confused. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, Greg, there were a lot of folks who were saying, um, oh, with the affirmative action ruling, okay, this is going to be a boon for HBCUs. Uh, hello, they are also targeting HBCUs. What people don't understand is your largest HBCUs are public institutions yeah. in red yeah. states. Right. So you're talking about uh, North Carolina has more HBCUs. Guess what? They're t state schools, Mississippi. Florida, Texas. So we see what's going on. So people need to understand that they think that these are going to be sort of, uh, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a escape areas from uh, these white supremacists. No, they're going to target the HBCUs. Florida got rid of uh, African American Studies program, even teaching sociology. That's exactly right. And and as you say, I mean. Almost all of the HBCUs are behind the cotton curtain there in the South. And the private institutions aren't safe either because, of course, if you get federal money through grants, uh, through federal financial aid, then that's their point of entry there. Um, again, I mean, this punk Stephen Miller and this America First is what you said, whether it be Ed Bloom, whether it be these billionaires pumping money into them. And remember, you covered this extensively, and you had this conversation ongoing about the black farmers. It was Miller and those punks at America First that messed up the $4 billion to the black farmers. Uh, it, it was them that went after the uh, the restaurant restoration funds during COVID, and, and it wasn't that other businesses couldn't apply, but uh, they were supposed to process those minority-owned restaurants first. This is all of their plan. And, and, and Chris, as, as you say, Chris, you know, the SFFA wasn't on its face about affirmative action, but really that is the point of entry to do. And, and, and I encourage them in this in, in one regard, because they're dying and they're fighting for the last dying gasp of their white ethno state. That is what they're doing. But you're not, go you can't kill us all and your babies ain't going to keep coming out in enough numbers to make anything. So they have gotten so desperate that they dropped all pretense of any rule of law and it's going to come down to this. It's going to come down to whether or not we are going to come together and fight these racists. And there's going to be nowhere to run, nowhere to hide because they have dropped all pretenses at this point. Yeah, and in, in the, when you're looking at HBCUs, remember the 1890s, which are all land grant institutions. And so there is that as well. That's right. That's right. There you go. Chris Messler, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thank you. Folks, we come back. President Joe Biden talks about broadband expansion in North Carolina, but it also talks about uh, how the economy is improving for everyone, including African Americans. We'll show you what he had to say next on Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Muhammad, live from L.A. 
And this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. We just have one of the oldest cultures that's desperately needed for mutual salvation. That's the consciousness. We have the keys in our roots to save mankind. We get to see the, the condition of other countries, other oceans, other cultures. And if we believe in God, a lot of us do. He's telling us if you don't get rid of that stuff that makes somebody superior or inferior and work together for a mutual salvation, everybody's gone. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin, unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? President Biden stopped in Raleigh, North Carolina today to announce a new investment from the American Rescue Plan's Capital Projects Fund. $82 million in new investments will connect an additional 16,000 North Carolinians uh, to high-speed uh, Internet as part of the Biden-Harris administration's Investing in America agenda. Overall, uh, some $3 billion has been invested in North Carolina to lower costs for families and connect everyone in the state to affordable, reliable, high-speed Internet. Now, I know somebody watching right now might be saying, OK, I don't understand what the big deal is, but people don't realize how many folks, literally, who live in rural America do not have access to high-speed Internet. And so we are requiring folks to apply for jobs, to check on uh, uh, medical status, all these sorts of things through the internet, but they have unreliable internet. Some places in North Carolina, uh, I was talking to one guy, they actually rely on Elon Musk Starlink to be able to access the internet. Some folks like, man, we don't want to do this, do that at all. And so here's Biden talking today in North Carolina. Bring an opportunity and hope to people and communities across this country. Let me give you one example of bringing high-speed internet to every person in America. Nearly a century ago, Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Rural Electrification Act, bringing electricity to every home and farm in America because it was in cities, but it wasn't in a lot of rural areas. Because electricity had become an essential part of modern life, so he wanted sure everyone had access to it. He was determined that no American should be left behind, no matter where they lived, whether in a big city or a rural area. Well, I tell you what. I made the same determination about our time, affordable, high-speed Internet. Now, it really is critical. It's just as essential today as electricity was a century ago. Who remembers, uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic when schools were shut down and uh, Master, the Sergeant First Class mentioned it, kids weren't able to attend school, so they go online. How many of you spent time in McDonald parking lots tapping into their internet so you could do the homework with your kid? Look, think of all the workers who need internet to do their jobs when they're working from home. So many are working from home have to work. Small businesses need internet to reach more customers here at home and literally around the world. And our seniors are needed in connection with their doctors through telemedicine because they can't make it to the doctors in person. High-speed internet isn't a luxury anymore. It's an absolute necessity. It's an absolute... No, it really is. And yet, when I became president, around 24 million Americans didn't have access to affordable high-speed internet. And for millions more, their internet connection was limited or unreliable. That's why, as soon as I came into office, I took action with what we call the American Rescue Plan. And it included... It included more than $25 billion to invest in affordable internet, high-speed internet all across America. While speaking, Biden also talked about uh, the improvements to the economy. 
unemployment has been below 4 percent for the longest stretch in American history in the last 50 years. And here in North Carolina, unemployment is even lower. It's 3.5 percent. And the stats coming out today show that seeking unemployment insurance has even gone down. Fewer people are needing the help. That's lower than it was in every single month under the last president. Wages are up. Household wealth is up, not only for middle-class Americans, for Latinos, for black Americans, for minorities. Mm, details, details, details. Um, the, the reality is they need to be pounding that home every single day, uh, John Quell, because the bottom line is when you watch, if you look at how mainstream media, how, how media talks about this here, it's like, oh, my God, the world is falling apart. Gas prices are sky high. They dropped. Inflation is sky high. It's dropped. All these different things. And so what, what you hear uh, from media outlets, uh, uh, urban uh, black morning shows and others is, oh, my God, they've been awful. They've been terrible. But when you look at the reality, it's a whole different story. Yeah, you're absolutely right, especially when it, you're coming after this press conference. Um, you know, it's interesting now, of course, with social media having kind of taken over for a lot of people, and especially a lot of African Americans and a lot of younger ones have taken to social media for their news outlets. And so they're following The Breakfast Club or some of these other blogs, and, they're, and that's where they're getting their news from. And it's a lot of misinformation that has been um, distributed um, in our community. And so it's important that the White House continue to do press conferences like these where we're able to get the real facts um, of what um, have been the accomplishments of the Biden-Harris administration. You know what, Lauren? I, I saw some BS earlier. Uh, uh, Piers Morgan was on The Breakfast Club, and he was talking about how Oh my God, Biden is just too old. He's not. He's he doesn't have any vigor. Uh, Kamala Harris has just been awful. She's done nothing for Biden. Then he says to Charlemagne and DJ Envy, you know, and she hasn't done anything for your people. And I'm sitting there going, uh, anybody gonna respond to that lie? Uh, and 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 that and that's what you see. You you hear the lies being told. And then when people hear that, go, that's right, he's right, when it's a lie. Yeah, I have no idea why the hell he was on The Breakfast Club. I have no idea why they would amplify him to the black community. Um, you know, everything now with media and the black community, uh, to the point just made, is the shade room in The Breakfast Club, Ben Charlemagne the God, and... Uh, I think that what is happening is a combination of what Reese said last week, a complete lack of strategy and investment by the Democratic Party into communications. And then some of it is just the fact that the driving force for making money on the Internet is salacious, controversial content. So people uh, who are on these shows are driven to uh, move salacious and controversial content that is often inaccurate delivered by people who don't know anything about public policy or politics. That doesn't seem to matter to anybody. And so as long as the thing is being clicked, they really don't care. So what's happening is a form of misinfo and disinfo at a really critical time in a really critical year. So instead of talking about the how dangerous Donald Trump is, we're putting people like Pierce Morgan on The Breakfast Club so he can run his mouth and say negative stuff about Kamala Harris. So you got to be kidding me. We've got Donald Trump quoting Adolf Hitler, and so, but we're attacking Kamala Harris. So right there, that is completely ridiculous, right? So, uh, but that's what everyone has decided. I shouldn't say everybody, but that's what many have decided to do for some reason. And it is, uh, it is absolutely dangerous. But a lot of that on the front end is the lack of strategy and investment by the Democratic Party, which has now reached a critical level. Been talking about it for years, for years and years before Donald Trump even got on the scene in 2016. And now we have Donald Trump because of that. And uh, I just don't know how to explain it. The, the Democratic Party has plenty of money. There's record amounts of fundraising coming in, records amount, amount of, of millions of dollars coming in, and they still refuse to invest in communication strategy 
at a time when our technology is all about communications. And I'm not how I don't know how you didn't learn this in 2016 when the Russians interfered with our election because of that strategy in part. But here we are. Well, I, I dare say this here, uh, and I absolutely agree with uh, investment. I agree with all of those different things. Uh, but I'm sorry, Greg, I don't need somebody to invest in me to know how to use Google. The, the bottom line is, I mean, the, the bottom line is the information is literally there. It's been posted on social media. It's posted sure. on whitehouse.gov. It's actually been covered. We talk about it constantly on this show. Uh, and so if a Piers Morgan comes on and lies, it's real easy to say, Piers, that's a lie. He literally said, oh, she's done nothing for your people. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and nobody said, Charlemagne or Envy didn't say almost $7 billion to HBCUs, didn't say record enrollment for the third consecutive year for Affordable Care Act, which has dropped Actually, uh, the number of black people who have who are uninsured uh, with health care didn't say anything about uh, the billions invested uh, in blacks in black small businesses. Didn't say anything along those lines. Those are undeniable facts. Uh, again, the closing of the black and white uh, 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 wage gap. When you talk about under Biden Harris, the lowest black unemployment rate ever. Those are easy things to say, to say, no, Piers, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Go back, go back to England. Well, it's easy for you, which is why he would never come on Roland Martin unfiltered. Oh, no, no, he, he ain't coming on here. In fact, uh, at the beginning of the, his people actually reached out, maybe it was a couple months ago, his people reached out to me for one of his shows, and I'm like, I said, sure, let's do it. I knew once he went back, they went back and told him I was booked. He was like, oh, hell no. So it was no surprise uh, I was uh, unbooked uh, and haven't been called back. So, yeah, Piers Morgan, he don't want this vote. No question. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, with all due respect to Lenard McKelvey and Rashawn Casey, no one, no human being in the world should listen to either of them on anything political. That's why they go on those shows. Because this is, we're in a propaganda war right now. Right. Um, and, and, you know, Lauren just laid this out. I mean, so, you know, I can only agree with everything she said. And, and I would say that, you know, Biden, Harris is in trouble right now. On foreign policy, they're getting their asses handed to them because babies are being killed as we speak in occupied Palestine. And today, Bibi Netanyahu said that Israel must control the entire area from the river to the sea. Netanyahu is trolling the world. And guess what? Genocide Joe has now got a nickname hung on him because he is so stuck on stupid that he is about to lose actively engaged voters in these key states like Michigan, for example. And when he's faced with that, he has to now politicize this and politicize this money that was passed because billions of dollars going to these Republican districts, these white nationalists are claiming credit for the very legislation they voted against, and he's still talking bipartisanship. See, he's not going to be banged up. He's going to be in Delaware or wherever he's going to be on his boat chilling with his sunglasses on, dark Brandon, and our people in harm's way are going to take the L. He has lost so many votes on the foreign policy because of his incorrect incorrect support of these fascist racists in Israel so he can forget that. The least he can do on the domestic side is now ball up his fist and swing. But he's not going to do that. And as far as people researching, it's not research. It's searching. When people Google stuff, they search it. It ain't research. And they're not even going to do that. They would rather listen to somebody who named himself after the head of the Holy Roman Empire and got the nerve to call <laughs> himself God, which is during my generation, my mother's generation, would have been considered blasphemy and a bunch of damn entertainers. This is the state of the American people, and we are all in harm's way. And this is th this is all very deliberate. And if we're gonna fight, we better figure out how to fight now. And I don't think the mummy is up to it, quite frankly. We might have to take this case to the people because hey, it ain't I, gonna go by. I, I, I made it clear, and y'all y'all understand. I'm not gonna let nobody come on this show or any show that I'm on, or even if I'm sitting on a panel or anywhere, or hell, if I'm sitting in the Uber, I'm not gonna let somebody lie. Right. If you lie, I'm going to check you right there. And because I keep saying to folk, you don't know who's on the other end of, 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 of what you're doing. You don't know who's listening or watching. 
and you could be a you could be a you could be allowing a lie to be reinforced by your silence when the lie is stated. That's right. And in fact, I actually said that on the Breakfast Club before. That that's what we have to understand. You can't allow lies to be weaponized because those who are not uh, fully engaged with the with the information may hear it and go, mm, man, Piers Morgan, he's a smart guy. He would know. And he said, they ain't enough for our people. It was a flat out lie. These things are happening over and over and over again. And yes, people need to understand. We are about to be engaged. We are in the middle of a massive misinformation, disinformation campaign. There are people who are deliberately putting out false information. They are pr deliberately putting out information that will inflame people to get them mad and upset uh, and, to, and to keep them from actually going to the polls. We must understand that. And Republicans are sitting there going, please, by all means, what did Donald Trump do in 2017? He said, black people, thank you for not voting. Now, when a white supremacist thanks black people for not voting, Every black person should be offended because he, you know exactly what that means. All right, folks, when we come back, Spelman College gets a $100 million donation, the largest ever of any HBCU. We'll talk with the president next right here on Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Grow your business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high-growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program, or all six. Earn a Google Career Certificate to prepare for a job in a high-growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. On a next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, we talk about a hard, cold fact. Not all healthcare is created equal in this country, especially if you're a person of color. So many of us Black families, we rely upon each other heavily. A lot of us aren't necessarily sure how to best communicate with our healthcare providers. How to take charge and balance the scales. Your life may depend on it. That's next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. Me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, Spelman College is receiving its largest single donation ever. In fact, it's the largest of any HBCU ever, a $100 million donation from uh, one of its board members. Joining us now is the president of Spelman College, Dr. Helene Gale. Doc, glad to have you on the show. Uh, you've been uh, beaming ear to ear uh, since um, announcing this uh, huge, huge donation. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, $100 million. That's a lot of money, and it's going to make a huge difference for Spelman College and for young women who are bright and qualified but don't have the financial resources to attend Spelman. So, you know, I'm just thrilled by this gift. It brought me to tears. Um, now, for folks who don't know, um, the gift came from... Uh, Rhonda Stryker and her husband, uh, William Johnson, who's the chairman of Greenleaf Trust. Uh, she's been a, been a member of the Board of Trustees for Spelman uh, for a number of years. She has. She's one of our longest-serving trustees. She is an incredibly generous donor. She's contributed a huge amount already to Spelman, but this is the largest single gift that she's contributed. And as you said, it's the largest single gift 
of any HBCU. So this is historic. Did, did, didn't the two of them give $30 million about five years ago? Yeah, they, they uh, contributed $30 million for um, a new building, our building for um, the Center for Innovation in the Arts. It will be named after my predecessor, Mary Schmidt Campbell. But they've also given other dollars um, to help to make Spelman more global and allow our students to be able to um, travel around the world to be able, they've contributed to other scholarship programs. So they have been incredible over so many years, but this is, this is like, this is a, a game changer. It's historic. Uh, how did this come about? Um, did she just call you up and say, hey, I'm about to do something? Or was this, w were there conversations the two of you had over a period of time? How did this transpire? Well, you know, there's been conversations that she's had with me, my predecessors, the chair of our board, our former board chair. And I think it's something that she's been thinking about for a while because, you know, she really has committed so much to Spelman. She believes in our mission. She believes that, you know, Spelman is an institution that changes and transforms people's lives. And so I think this is something she's been thinking about for a while. How are you going to use the money? Uh, how is it going to be partitioned? So most of it will go to scholarships. And, you know, I think, um, you know, that's a big passion for her. I think it's clearly been a passion for me since I've come on to Spelman. I see so many talented young women who, you know, lives are changed as a result of getting this education. But many of them leave strapped with debt and there are so many more who have the talent but don't have the access and the opportunity. So being able to endow scholarships, and th this, is, this is not to give out today, tomorrow. This is to endow for our endowment for, so that far into the future, we will be able to support young women, uh, outstanding, bright, brilliant young women who will benefit from a Spelman education. You know, we will also be able to give scholarships to young women who are there today, but this is really about securing the future. Um, questions from our panel. John Quill, you're first. Yes, this is such an exciting time, an exciting day. I mean, I myself am a graduate of Clark Atlanta University, so I went to school right next door, and I also took classes at Spelman. Um, while I was at Clark Atlanta. Um, so for those that don't know, the Atlanta University Center, which comprises Spellhouse, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, um, Morris Brown, um, the ITC, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of buildings we share. We share the library, the Woodruff Arts Center. Um, we take classes on each other's campuses. Um, there's land that is shared also amongst the universities. And so with this being such a historic gift, and I know it's very early on, is there any way that um, that it will benefit the entire AUC or maybe some of those shared buildings and things like that that we all share with one another? Well, you know, the way I think it will benefit not only the AUC but HBCUs in general is that I think this is a landmark gift. And I think it says that it is worth investing in HBCUs. We have been so underinvested for so long. And as you know, going to, to Clark, you know, we punch well above our weight, uh, but we don't have the resources that many of our peer, predominantly white institutions have. So, you know, while this, this, these resources are really primarily for scholarships, for Spelman, um, I think that it lifts um, the sights and the vision and the inspiration for all HBCUs. So I'm hoping that this is a sign that says to, to other donors that HBCUs are worth investing in and worth investing in in a big way. Greg. Thank you, Roland, and thank you, and congratulations, President Gill. Um, great news for HBCUs in the last week or so. We saw, we all saw the $100 million that the Lilly Endowment gave to UNCF for this pooled uh, endowment for smaller schools. I have a couple of questions. You know, we know we, we all have a lot of good, uh, these good young sisters who get into Spelman, very competitive, and then can't afford it. How might this gift 
transform your capacity to offer scholarships for students. Because, and, and I know sometimes, and I know you've heard it, Spelman gets a bad rap. Say, yeah, you can get in, but they don't give a whole lot of money out. Now, I don't think that's true. But, but I, 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 that's one question. And the other question, I think, which is pursuing to that as well, a lot of folks, and, I, and I've been teaching at Howard the last 23 years, so I know we, we come up against this as well. A lot of folks might not understand how the three quarters you're going to put toward the endowment for endowing scholarship works. People might think you're going to give that money out. Do you mind explaining how an endowed scholarship pool works differently than just giving out $75 million worth of scholarships over X number of years? Thank you, first yeah. of all. Yeah, thank you for those questions. So first of all, I think, you know, it is partly true. We don't have the resources that we would like to be able to give out to our students. And so, you know, we do have many students who get into Spelman and then can't continue because they just don't have the resources. They got in and they were hoping that they could figure it out and it could work. But after taking out loans and after their parents taking out loans, it's just not feasible. And so, you know, this hopefully will be one of the ways in which we'll be able to help with that. You know, our uh, student population, 40% are Pell eligible, so come from the you know lowest uh, economic um, status. Uh, we give out about 80%, 80 percent of our students are on some sort of need-based loan. So we have a high need population, but we also have a population of young women who um, are academically gifted and talented. And so, you know, that's where we want to be able to fill that gap, you know, where there is that talent and that um, capability and potential, we want to be able to match that with the financial resources. So on endowments, you know, endowments are just like putting money into a money market, savings account, or anything else that any of us do where we try not to cut into the principal, we want to make sure that that keeps earning interest. And so from that interest uh, that comes from investing our endowment, that's what we will then spend for scholarships. And that's what keeps us able to then continue to give scholarships um, on and on and on, because we keep that principal to keep working for us and then spend the interest that comes from our investments. Yes. Lauren? Uh, President Gail, how are you? Um, I wonder when, when you have these big, big, big donations, are, are there any stipulations on, on this type of donation? Do they in any way try to control how you uh, spend the money, or do you get to pretty much do what you like? Well, you know, it depends on, on the donor and how much uh, of a relationship they have with the institution, how much they see this as a partnership. In the case of Rhonda Stryker, you know, she's been a board member for a long time. She, I think she trusts uh, that Spellman will do well with the resources. But she did say the general categories that she and her husband wanted the resources to be spent on. So, you know, most of it going into endowments for scholarships, some of it also going to help to upgrade our housing, uh, some of it to do innovations in our academic programs, and then to have some discretion for uh, immediate needs. So, you know, she gave us some broad outlines, but also understood that um, this is about a partnership, and she had faith in Spellman and that Spellman would use these resources wisely. Uh, um, first of all, what's the student population uh, at Spellman? Uh, about 25, just under 2,500. And uh, normally, what is your incoming class? Uh, where or how many? No, the no, size of your incoming freshman class. Uh, it fluctuates between 600 to um, uh, almost 800 in, in some of the years. It's been very high. So if you look at the annual tuition, it's about $29,000. So that means if you have 600 students coming in, let's say if Spelman decides to say, okay, we're going to grant a $5,000 scholarship to each incoming student, uh, that means that you're going to be spending about $3 million annually. Uh, and so when you talk about these scholarships, just sort of how are you thinking about that? Uh, are you thinking in terms of incoming or you're saying, hey, let's look at distributing scholarships uh, to folks who are freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors? Um, 
when I did um, a scholarship with McDonald's a couple of years ago, uh, I told them I only wanted the scholarships uh, for juniors and seniors. I said, because a lot of programs are set up for people who are high school seniors. I said, but the problem is a lot of students who go to HBCUs, they may spend their first and second year there, uh, but when they get to that third year, many of them simply can't afford uh, to go. So how are you thinking about, you know, you know breaking that up uh, to assist uh, students? So, you know, this is, this is uh, a new gift and we're still thinking through all of the uh, ways in which we will use the resources, the, the uh, interest, the, what comes from, from the investment, uh, how we will use that over time. Uh, there weren't specific stipulations that said that it had to go to one class or another. And I think what we want to really do is do it in a thoughtful way that makes sure that we're giving resources to students at greatest need and that we can help to fill that gap so that students who come to Spelman don't leave with a huge debt burden um, or that they can't, uh, students who really can be competitive at Spelman aren't able to do it because of finances. So we're still thinking through some of those details, but you know, I think we want to do it in a way that really helps to bridge that gap between you know, the incredible talent and potential and the financial needs that exist. All right, then, uh, President Gale, we sure appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks a lot, folks. When we come back, we'll talk about the Department of Justice. They dropped their analysis of what happened in Uvalde, Texas, where 21 kids were gunned down, and it is not good for law enforcement. We'll discuss it next right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Be sure to support us in what we do. Send your check and money order to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2007-0196. Cash App, Dallas Side, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available at bookstores nationwide. Get the audio version on Audible. We'll be back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 dash. 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, nurses are the backbone of the healthcare industry. And yet, only 7% of them are black. What's the reason for that low number? Well, a lack of opportunities and growth in their profession. Joining us on the next Get Wealthy is Needy Bartonelli. She's gonna be sharing exactly what nurses need to do and what approach they need to take to take ownership of their success. So the Black Nurse Collaborative really spawned from a place and a desire to create opportunities to uplift each other those of us in the profession, to also look and reach back and create, and create pipelines and opportunities for other nurses like us. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Me, Sherry Shepard. This is Sammy Roman. I'm Dr. Robin B., pharmacist and fitness coach, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
A complete failure. That's what the Justice Department calls a law enforcement response to the shooting in Uvalde on May 24th of last year. The 610-page report is comprised of more than 14,000 pieces of data and documentation, including training logs, audio, video, uh, closed captioned video, photographs, personal records, and investigative records of more than 260 interviews of people involved or affected, including police officers, elected officials, hospital workers, and survivors. During a news conference on Thursday, U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland said that the victims deserve better from law enforcement. The department's review concluded that a series of major failures, failures in leadership, in tactics, in communications, in training, and in preparedness, were made by law enforcement leaders and others responding to the mass shooting at Robb Elementary. The law enforcement response at Robb Elementary School on May 24, 2022, and in the hours and days after, was a failure that should not have happened. We hope to honor the victims and the survivors by working together to try to prevent anything like this from ever happening again, here or anywhere. The massacre at Robb Elementary shattered families throughout this community and devastated our, our country. 19 children and two teachers were killed. And untold numbers of students teachers, and law enforcement officers were injured. The law enforcement response to the mass shooting at Robb Elementary was a failure. As a threat posed to our country by mass shootings has grown and evolved over the past several decades, law enforcement's response tactics have also changed. The massacre at Columbine High School 25 years ago and the 47 minutes it took for law enforcement to enter that high school marked a major shift in how law enforcement leaders think about responding to mass shootings. It is now widely understood by law enforcement agencies across the country that in active shooter incidents, time is not on the side of law enforcement. Every second counts. And the priority of law enforcement must be to immediately enter the room and stop the shooter with whatever weapons and tools officers have with them. That is the approach responding officers first employed when they arrived at Robb Elementary School. But within minutes of arriving inside the school, officials on scene transitioned from treating the scene as an active shooter situation to treating the shooter as a barricaded subject. This was the most significant failure. That failure meant that law enforcement officials prioritized the protracted evacuation of students and teachers in other classrooms instead of immediately rescuing the victims trapped with the active shooter. It meant that officials spent time trying to negotiate with the subject instead of entering the room and confronting him. It meant that officials asked for and waited for additional responders and equipment instead of following generally accepted active shooter practice and moving toward the shooters, shooter with the resources they had. It meant waiting for a set of keys to open the classroom door, which the report concludes was likely unlocked anyway. And it meant that the victims remained trapped with the shooter for more than an hour after the first officers arrived on scene. Folks, the Uvalde, Texas shooting is one of the deadliest in United States history. As he said, 19 children and two teachers died in the massacre. Lauren, we think about what, what, what happened there. I mean, this was um, shameful and despicable. Um, frankly, uh, Governor, uh, T Texas Governor Greg Abbott should be ashamed of himself. Uh, local law enforcement, Texas Department of Public Safety. I mean, you had hundreds of law enforcement there, and they frankly sat on their asses and were scared to go in. Uh, yeah, they were scared to go in. And that really contrasts with what we see in a lot of other uh, shooting incidents, unfortunately, we have uh, so many in this country that we can compare and contrast very easily. 
And, for example, the shooting at the Covenant School in Tennessee, if you remember the footage from that, I think there were three law enforcement officers uh, with high-powered weaponry that went in right away and took down the shooter uh, very quickly. In this particular episode, which is extremely strange, uh, these cops apparently were afraid to go in. And, of course, what we're left with is one of the most famous, you know, incidents in that, in that Uvalde massacre was that young mother who was begging cops to go in and eventually snuck around the police, went into the school and got her kids out. Can't get any more cowardice than that. She had no guns. She had nothing. She went in and got her kids. I mean, it was just extremely strange, because you typically do see from law enforcement, uh, and again, unfortunately, because uh, the United States has so many uh, mass shootings that these departments have a protocol for this, uh, even the smaller departments have a protocol for this, which is that you go in as quickly as possible and you confront the person who is uh, murdering people as quickly as possible. Uh, this was a really strange thing. And, and if you remember, the, the chief of that, of that area, Pete Arandondo, came up missing and had to be hunted down by a correspondent on CNN. It was very strange. Uh, it remains very strange. I'm not sure why it took this long to do this report. It was sort of known in the first two months that there was a, a mass, massive failure here. And uh, it, it's just so terrible, because these were little kids that were killed. And, uh, of course, the bigger problem is the amount of high-powered weaponry that we uh, allow people to go in and purchase very easily. But uh, it was a shameful thing that this members of this department were scared to go in and confront this 19-year-old. This John Quell? Um, this incident, which is so horrible, to even revisit, which we're, we have to keep doing. It's, number one, um, it's a lack of training, a lack of protocol. From what I read in the article that one of the high-ranking police officers in the department didn't bring his radio. So you're one of the top commanding officers there, and you don't have your radio to send out commands to um, or any or, or or through dispatch or anything to communicate with the police officers there, um, the prosecutor's office uh, also uh, gave a press conference um, and discussed about uh, investigating for any potential criminal conduct. But however, um, in the Texas Code, I was unable to find anything that could find any of these officers criminally liable for their behavior. There's one specific misdemeanor, um, which would be the official oppression, which reads in Section 39.03, a public servant acting under color of his office or employment commits an offense if he intentionally uh, subjects another to mistreatment or to arrest, search, seizure, um, and so, essentially, that's the only thing. And so, we're talking about a misdemeanor um, because they're discussing that they're investigating them for criminal conduct. But this is something that has to be addressed by the Texas legislature, right? I mean, they they've got to address this kind of egregious behavior. Seventy seven minutes, seventy seven minutes, all the deaths of these children and of these teachers. I mean, it's 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 horrifying. And, you know, it's interesting because we have the issues of excessive force used by all these police officers across the country, which we regularly talk about um, on this show. Um, the Washington Post published an article where $1.5 billion are spent paying for officers in their use of excessive force. But in contrast, when we have these mass shootings, they're not doing anything. Um, and it's... It's a problem. I mean, it's a problem. It's a systematic problem with training, with the hiring and retention of these officers. Um, it, 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 it's a problem, and it's 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 just so tragic. Greg? Yeah. Um, you know, when you're dealing with others, it's very easy to do what these cowards did the shovel-mouthed coward who is the governor of Texas, the Texas legislature, state and local officials, when they're dealing with others, other people's children, perhaps their brown children, you know, it's not your children. 
other other people's teachers teaching other people's children. Then you sit out with your puffed up vests and chests, with your thumbs in your in in your collar, like you're on an episode of Chicago PD, and you pretend with your funky boots on, like you're some kind of funky Texas Ranger. And and, and so you know none of that is surprising. We saw that in real time. What should be, I think it is, equally disturbing for all of us, maybe even more disturbing, is in the wake of the slaughter, the misinformation campaign, the attempt to paint it as if it was something that it that it wasn't. This is where the true cowardice comes out, because at the end of the day, even though you treat others differently, you're still a human being. And they should uh, now wear the mark of you should be ostracized. Forget shame. We don't care whether they sh they're shamed themselves. We should ostracize them. These, should be, these people should be exiled from our common community of humanity. They're going to keep their badges. They're going to keep their guns, even though they won't be shooting them uh, in defense of anyone, probably at us. But they shouldn't be able to go to the grocery store, the gas station, or anywhere else without people simply just looking the other way. And if they make eye contact, just shake your head. Why? Because we have to change the society. We will continue to fight to change the society. But people like this and action like this, you, you, even if you can't change it immediately in the courts or in policymaking, you can damn sure change it in the way you treat these people every day. Uh, absolutely. Folks, uh, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Greg, Jonquel, Lauren, thanks so much. Folks, uh, that's it for us. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow right here on Roland Martin on the on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to support us in what we do uh, by joining our Brina Funk fan club. Your donations are critically important to our growth. We do the work that is that's really important. See your checking money order, P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal, or Martin Unfiltered. Um, Venmo is RM Unfiltered, Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And don't forget to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Available bookstores nationwide. We'll be right back. Uh, sorry, we'll see you tomorrow uh, right here on the show. Holla! Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches! I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Black I support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?